Praise the Lord. Got all kinds of ringing and humming and chiming back here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My chains are gone. You know, freedom in Christ is what the Lord is concerned with in our life. We walk as free people of God. He set us free. It's another thing for us to shake those chains of bondage off. We've been talking about some of the things over the last several weeks that create this bondage in our lives. Talking about moral issues. Uh, I know that's not a popular subject in today's immoral society that we live in, but nonetheless, uh, we're talking about these things. We're, and I, I really want to, I've tried to make clear in each service, but I really want you to understand the heartbeat of these messages. It has to do with uh, having virtue in our life. That's a word that's not used a lot and in some circles is even frowned upon or laughed at or made mockery of. Uh, everything from the media to the Hollywood to the sports arena when somebody comes out and talks about virginity is kind of, you know, frowned and, you know, a few jokes are made on the side. And uh, even listening to sports radio here this last week, I just finally quit listening to the station I'd been listening to because of their constant slam against uh, athletes who get up and declare any kind of uh, uh, virtue in their life. But you need to understand virtue is a very important issue. Paul, when Peter wrote the church, he said, listen, and he's talking about if you want a life that's not filled with stumbling and falling and failure, he said, add to your faith. And he listed, you know, seven, eight, nine things. But one of the first things he listed was add to your faith virtue. Now, virtue is a word we just don't know a lot about today. And because it hasn't been uh, at the forefront before the Christian, it's a vital, important issue. It's the very first thing the Lord says, you know, throughout Scripture that once we become Christians. I mean, Paul wrote about it. John writes about it. James deals with it. Every book of the New Testament deals with it. The Old Testament deals with it. About the importance, if we're going to be the people of God, then our lives need to be marked with integrity and character and purity. And moral purity is a very important thing in the life of the believer. Out of moral purity comes this element or issue of virtue. And I, I sought for many years to come up with a, a description for this word because I don't think it's been dealt with enough. But I really believe from everything I understand, it has to do with strength of character. That, that you know, a lot of people, they, they face the, the enemies of life and they stand on the front line of the battles of life. And they always fail. They always stumble and they always fall because there's not much uh, moral fortitude, strength in there. And... We don't realize that that virtue, strength, that power comes from making right choices in our life. It's like that if I choose, when faced with temptation and issues in my life, if I choose to go in the wrong direction and disregard or disobey what God has said, then I open my life up to the things that will bring dissolution. And what does that mean? It's like if you have a concentrate of something, the concentrate is the pure, strongest form of it that when you add water to it, there's dissolution takes place. It, it weakens it. God has given you this, this new life in Christ Jesus, and you should live it with your roots sunk deep in Him, and out of that comes, it's like a tree, out of that comes good fruit, all right? A virtuous, full, meaningful, powerful life for living, and you really know what it means to, to grab for the gusto. You don't have to pop a can to find it, all right? You know what it means to find the zest of life and it's not in a bar of soap, okay? You really understand the, the, what joy is and what victory is and what fullness is because you've discovered real life. And the more that you choose to make morally right decisions in your life and not dilute the well, all right, of virtue, then the greater your strength and capacity is. I, I think of virtue, a good biblical illustration of that from the Old Testament is David who goes out, he's a young man filled with virtue, Moral strength, and that, that produced brave, it produces courage. It, you know, all those elements were a part of this young man's life because he was so steeped and wrapped in, in, in the Word of God. So that when he goes out and he faces the real physical battles like a Goliath, he can deal with it and he can be an overcomer. So we deal with these issues like morality because you as a Christian, you need to have strength. And you need to have power for living. And that, a great deal of that comes, obviously, it's the, our life in Christ, it's the Word of God in us. But as we personally grow in grace and as we exercise and choose not to fill our lives with a profane, then out of that comes purity of our life and out of that comes strength for living. Uh, are you getting what I'm saying here? I, it's like I say, I've, I've wrestled for a long time on just really wrapping my mind and my head around the depth of that Word. Now, I don't even think I've begun to penetrate what the whole idea of virtue really is. All right, what it really means to have virtue in your life. 
And out of that comes such grace, and out of that comes such strength, and out of that comes an understanding of God, and knowing God, and knowing God's will, and hearing God's voice, and uh, discovering the reality of Jesus. He's not just Jesus in the Bible, or I have Jesus in my heart, you know. And it goes well beyond that to, to, to say, I'm, I'm, Jesus is in my life, and not just in my heart. He's in my actions. He's in my decisions. He's in, my, he's in the process of my life. If you're with me, say, uh-huh, at least. All right, it's a little dark out there. I can't always see your face. Can't tell if you're grinning or, or smiling or, 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 or just real sad. Uh, hopefully, uh, all the above, depending on your situation. Amen? But we want to deal with today's message as, we, as we're going to experiment with a brand new remote, all right? See if I can learn the lessons. The first thing we're going to look at is in, in today's message about moral issues is this issue of pornography. We've talked about homosexuality and premarital sex, and we, we dealt with a lot of moral issues from fornication, adultery. Today specifically, I want to talk about what I think is the number one thing that's plaguing uh, our country, in fact, the world today, in this issue of pornography. What, what about? I mean, what does the Bible say? How do we address this issue? Uh, what's wrong? What's right? And why is it wrong? And why is it right? Et cetera, et cetera. So let's, let's look at that today as we talk about the plague, first and foremost, of pornography. You know, just th that there is, and I do believe, plague is a good word for this. If you, if you go to the dictionary and you look up pornography, what is pornography, you'll see that has a definition will go something like this. Well, it's anything with sexually explicit pictures or sexually explicit writings or other materials. Uh, the vast majority of pornography users in our country, uh, as well as in the world, are, are, are men. But now we're seeing a great influx of women being involved in pornography. And a lot of that's being reflected in the culture through the movies, the TVs, uh, through, uh, through the media industry that's out there. When, you, when one of the top selling books in our nation is Fifty Shades of Grey. Folks, any shade of grey is sin. Now, that's a little slant on the book, but the book is about an intimate relationship that this woman has, and it's, a, it's basically a, a pornographic book. And everywhere you go, I don't know about you, but I, I see women have this little book tucked away in their little bag there or something, or carrying it in or reading it. And when you go to Starbucks, you'll see somebody reading it. Or something. You just, it's just everywhere you go. And then, to add to the, 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 uh, the, the immorality of it all, to see the influence of pornography upon women as well as in our culture. You see some of the top, top selling movies in the country are, are movies like Magic Mike, you know, about a male stripper and a male stripper entourage. And uh, great news, they're coming out with Magic Mike 2. I mean, what have we not seen here, okay? Anyway, the idea is that our country is so exposed to this. And, and I mean, I know some couples who in the past have told me, well, we use pornography in our relationship to spice up our life and our sexual life. And they have no idea as to what they're opening their heart and their mind and, their, and how much that, of that dissolution is taking place in the strength of their life. They're being destroyed. It is, it's big business in our country. No matter where you go, uh, you'll see this all around us. According to U.S. News and World Report, excuse me, I get one of these buttons right. U.S. News and World Report, it's, it's, a, it's a massive industry, $13 billion per year. That's just, in, you know, just the surface numbers that we know about. That doesn't tell us a, a whole lot, but let me say that there are major corporations in our country today that are making millions, if not billions of dollars off this particular type of industry. In fact, General Motors, somebody would think, but General Motors, the world's largest company, they sell more graphic sex films through their TV subsidiary, and you may not know who owns this particular subsidiary, Direct TV. Uh, they, they sell more pornography than does, you know, Larry Flint's Hustler magazine. Then you have Echo Star Communications, uh, the number two satellite provider in the country. They make more money selling sexually explicit films than does Playboy selling their magazines, their cable productions, their internet business. So it's estimated that 60% of all the websites that are out there on the internet, more than half of them are pornographic websites. One statistic I, I read said that Americans spent $300 million on fee-based websites. Now, if you just broke that down and said, well, that's everybody in the country is watching porn and paying for it on the internet, that breaks down to about $30 per person in the United States. By the way, that's more spent on gambling in our country. It has all those same links as gambling to organized crime as well. United States of America is now the leading producer of pornographic sites. They are churning out hardcore videos on a basis that's astonishing. In fact, they say there's 150 new pornographic, hardcore pornographic videos produced in America per week. 150. See, America 
You know that porn in, in America is now is just American as apple pie. And on every corner of our society, people are being affected, or should I say infected by pornography, and that includes the church even, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But let me just kind of give you an idea just how big this business is. I shared some of these statistics at our men's conference this year. The amount spent, or the amount of money made by the pornographic industry in America is larger than Hollywood's domestic box office receipts combined. You think about all these major blockbuster movies that make hundreds of millions of dollars. Porn makes more money than all those combined. They say Americans now spend more money at strip clubs than at Broadway shows, off-Broadway shows, Branson shows, regional and nonprofit theaters, at the opera, the ballet, the jazz and classical music performances, all combined. In America, porn is the number seven grossing industry in, in, our, in our nation. In fact, they tell us that the revenue made from the porn industry in the United States, the revenue from that industry in this country alone are bigger than the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, all combined. And we know what kind of money they put out. Worldwide porn sales are reported to be $57 billion. Now, let me put this a little bit into perspective of what, of what, what we're really looking at. Microsoft Corporation, that's the, one of the largest companies in the world. They sell their software that operates most of the computers, business computers around the world. And they made, just f several years back, about $37 billion. Now, most of the profits being generated by porn today well overgo that because we're looking at $57 billion. And then you add to that another element of porn, the telephone uh, sex communications that take place every night between the peak hours of 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. Perhaps a quarter of a million Americans will pick up the phone and dial a number for commercial phone sex. Now, again, this is just becoming an accepted way of societies. In fact, there are more pornographic outlets for hardcore pornography in our country than there are standing McDonald's. Now, some of you just can't quite wrap your heads around that, but we're talking about a major big deal. And anything that involves that much money, it's kind of hard to, to have any kind of legislation that's going to stand up and compete with those kind of things. The introduction of pornography, especially to the World Wide Web, has made the home computer the fastest growing and the primary mode of distribution of all pornography in our country. It used to be that you used to get a little brown paper sack with their pornography written in or your videos or your magazines so nobody would know you were getting it. The mailman would deliver it to your door and you'd open it up. But not so today with pornography. It comes, you know, every, every front you can get it. They say that 38 percent of uh, adults in this country believe it's morally acceptable to look at pictures of nudity or explicit, explicit sexual behavior. 59% of adults believe it's morally acceptable to have sexual thoughts and fantasies continually. Now, let me just, just define this for a moment. It's one thing to have a sexual thought. It's another thing to stay and camp there. It's kind of like I think it was Martin Luther said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. It's the same thing with pornography. You may have a thought, but it's what you do with that thought. And this is what they're talking about. 59% of Americans think it's all right to maintain and, and uh, entertain those thoughts on a, con on a, on a, on, on a continual basis. 38% of these people that were compared, uh, polled said there's nothing wrong with pornography use whatsoever. 41% of surveyed adults admitted they felt less attractive due to their partner's pornography use. In other words, my husband or my wife uses pornography, therefore it makes them feel less attractive. In the church, as I said, which is a problem, and I'm going to give you an, a, a, just a poll that was taken years ago, and I haven't seen many new statistics on this regard, but in, one of the major Christian outlets for media, magazine outlets, is Christianity Today. They did a survey where they said 33% of pastors, people in ministry, admitted to having visited a sexually explicit website. So we're talking about the influence upon the church as well. Of those who had visited these said websites, 53 said they had done it a few times in the past year. 18% said they visited sexually explicit sites between a couple of times a month or more than once a week. Out of these pastors that were surveyed, 98% said they had been exposed to porn, just by, by flipping through the web or whatever. 43% said they intentionally access, accessed Assess the, uh, access the sexually explicit website. And almost nine out of ten of these pastors also said they counsel on a regular basis lay people in the churches who are fighting this particular issue. In fact, I 
share this particular pastor's letter at our men's retreat this last year. And uh, this was written by a pastor. He said, I had a hard time believing that half the men in my church would be accessing porn. So in 2004, I asked the church where we attended at that time if they'd be willing to take a survey. And the church agreed to take this survey. And we asked the men, when was the last time you looked at pornography? The church was made up of mostly young families, and the idea that many of husbands and fathers I set to every Sunday were dabbling in porn, well, I just couldn't comprehend it. Surely I thought the numbers would be lower for my church. It can't be half, not in my church. And here's what came back. He said, 25% my church have viewed porn within the past month. 44% within the past six months. 61% within the past year. So we see that not only is pornography a plague within our culture, it's also becoming a plague within the church. And it hasn't been exempt from this curse. In fact, George Barno, in one of his survey, he says that 28% of born-again Christians feel it's acceptable to view pornographic pictures. Now catch this. He's talking to people who claim to be believers. We're Christians. And almost one-third of them said, oh, it's okay to watch, look at pornography and watch pornography. It's no, it's no big deal. Nothing wrong with it. Now, let me say, if you are a born-again, that term's become a loose term these days, but if you genuinely are a born-again believer, that means that new life has occurred. You've been born again, which means the whole idea of rebirth is that you're born now of the Spirit. All right, you were born of the flesh. When you meet Christ, he births this new life into you. And when that new life comes, the Holy Spirit comes in to abide. All right, he lives in you. The Holy Spirit now, he's there to teach you. He's there to guide you. He's there to reprove you when you're wrong and encourage you when you're right and help you to do what's right and enable you to, to live the Christian life. I am sure that everything that the Bible says tells us that pornography is it's, it's immorality, it's ungodliness, and it's against the nature of God and what God's design is. So if God lives in me by the presence of his Holy Spirit, if you say you're a believer and God lives in you, then there's no way that you can really fall into that 28% unless you are so well deceived and so covered your eyes to see the truth of God's word that you've come to that place where you can literally delude yourself into that kind of non-conviction because the Holy Spirit will correct you when things are not right. I don't know about you, when I got saved, I found I couldn't get away with much of anything. Amen. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit's there. Josh McDowell, who's a national speaker and mostly at youth uh, events and written several books and some really great books, you know, he made, a, he made mention in one of the uh, interviews, he said, listen, uh, virtually all teenage boys look at pornography. And again, the culture gets by, oh, that's just the nature, you know, that's what it's all about, that's what's going to happen. Matthew 25, Jesus gives his thoughts on the issue of lusting after someone that you're not married to. He said, you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you just look at a woman to lust for her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Now this is what the Bible says, and these words are, although they're in black and white or yellow on the screen there, they're in red letters in your Bible. The red letters are there just to show you what the words of Jesus are, all right? So Jesus makes it very clear. If you're a person who dabbles or looks at or, you know, is drawn to pornography, then there's an issue that you have in your heart, and it's a heart issue, and he calls it sin. You've opened the door for sin in your life. Now, we said what is pornography, and we talked about what it was from a dictionary definition, but I want to look beyond just what the dictionary says about the definition of it and talk about what pornography really does and the dangers of it. Now, I know there's some of you sitting here that you don't want to hear this message. You're ready. You know, if you thought you'd get away with it, you'd walk out right now. But you, because this is, this, is, this, is, this is something that cuts, again, across the accepted behavior by culture. Similar to last week's message when we talked about the issue of homosexuality. Similar to the week before that when we talked about adultery. Similar to the week before that when we talked about premarital sex. Because our culture has so moved away from the standards that God has given us that we now view all these things as normal and natural and acceptable behavior. But you need to realize that, you know, pornography cuts against the grain of everything that God intended for man, at least in regard to his morality and his sexuality. It is a perversion that attacks everything that God cherishes most. The Bible makes it clear to us that man is made in the image of God. All right? You were created in God's image. And God created man and he created woman and he bound them together in holy matrimony and he set the standard as to what that was and what matrimony is. It's between a man and a woman. It's reiterated again in Matthew 19 when Jesus talks about it. You know, I know the society says well, it's between a man and a woman and anybody they want to marry, have a meaningful relationship, but God has already defined these issues for us. All right? 
And here we have a clear word from the word of God that pornography and to, in other words, to look at these kind of things and to lust in this kind of fashion is not what God designed for your life. The foundation, at least if you take a theological approach and a biblical approach against pornography, it begins with this simple premise, according to creation, that man is a sacred being, all right? He's created in the image of God. He's created with dignity. And he should maintain that dignity and understand the aspect of what it means to be made in the image of God. That's why Job even said when he's talking about these issues in the Old Testament, Job said this, you know, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? Why, why should I be looking at other women? Why should I be thinking about other women? My eyes, my mind belong to God and to the one whom I've made a lifetime commitment to. Now, if you're here and you're saying, well, I haven't made a commitment yet to anybody, you will, most likely. You will. And if anything else, you should have made one to God. And God gives you a standard for righteousness. Now, we, if you just simply go back and look at the messages over the last few weeks, we've laid out very clearly what that standard is. Why did he give us these standards? Why did he give us these kind of boundaries that, that we should live in our life in? He gave them to us for our protection. He gave them to us so we could discover that virtue of living, so we could know what it really means to have life and to experience life abundantly. But the culture is so depraved anymore. The mindset of the world is so afar adrift from what God has established in the beginning, now the world is open to anything. And one thing you should discover about pornography is not only is it a perversion of everything that God designed for us, it is also a lie. It's a lie. It says that you can have something without any, you know, price to pay for it or any commitment to it or any regard for it. In fact, pornography basically says the best sex is outside of marriage. When the Bible tells us in Hebrews, that's not true. The Bible tells us the best sex is in marriage. And outside marriage, it defiles you. Again, it gets back to what we talked about in the introduction, to being defiled. You have this, this virtuous life that God wants you to live. Don't dilute it. Don't pervert it. Don't destroy it. Pornography promises something that it can not deliver and is not able to deliver. In fact, Proverbs wrote this in the book of Proverbs. Solomon said, you know, stolen waters are sweet. They're sweet. The problem is if you read the rest of Proverbs, it talks about judgment from drinking stolen waters. And stolen waters mean you're taking something for your benefit that doesn't belong to you and is not yours. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us there's a way which seems right unto man, but the end of that way is destruction. So in other words, Hollywood, even Congress, even the Supreme Court, you know, even, even legislators, education may tell us certain things are acceptable. Everybody's doing it. There's no big deal. The Bible says if you go down those paths, there's going to be a price that you're going to pay personally. It's going to hurt you personally. It's going to affect you personally. You cannot commit and live this, in this kind of sin and not be infected by it. It's going to, it's going to bring pain and heartache. The effects are devastating. The, the, the victims, as you look at pornography, are heartbreaking. And I just want to say a few words about that this morning. Who is really hurt by it? Because the defenders of pornography will tell you stuff like, it's not bothering anybody. It's not going to hurt anybody. And what I do in the privacy of my home is my business. Let me tell you, what you do in the privacy of your home is your business. It is your business. All right? But it's my business to tell you the certain business that you do that's going to hurt your business. All right? That's going to hurt your life. And I don't want to see you, nor did God want to see you, nor did any other body, anybody else that stands on moral absolutes of Scripture want to see you destroy your life. There's a better way of living. There's a fuller way of life. There's a way to experience the abundance of life. But it's not going to be from going this particular route. Pornography breeds and leaves a trail of destruction everywhere it goes. It harms children. It's amazing to see in almost all child sexual molestation cases, adult pornography is connected with each and every incident and child pornography with the majority of them. See all these cases of pedophilia, you can link most every one of them back, almost every incident back to pornography. If not adult hardcore pornography, then it's gone into that twisted, it's all twisted, child pornography. It's just case after case after case. Pornography becomes the enemy. 
which destroys the innocence of little children of young people. It is estimated that approximately one in three girls in our country and one in seven boys will be sexually molested by the age of 18. That's 77% of those who are molested boys, 80% of those are molested girls say that those who molested them, those persons who were the perpetrators, they were involved as regular users of hardcore pornography, leading to what? The taking advantage of the innocent. In fact, UNICEF, a worldwide children organization, reports that one million children each year are forced into prostitution and used as well to make videos, pornography for child trafficking. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sick world we live in. But listen, you can't drink from a poisonous well and not be poisoned. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but pornography is an enemy that destroys the innocence of young children. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says about those people who would do that. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Now, I don't know, folks, but, you know, I'm continually heartbroken at the cases over and over and over of children who've been molested by a father or by an uncle or by someone in a family or some relative or some family member or some educator. It's every hand on every corner that you see it in our culture, in our society. What leads people to do that? They begin to open up slowly but surely the thoughts of the mind through pornography that lead them right down this particular path. Not only with children, but women. Pornography obviously degrades women, where women are seen as animals and playthings and, you know, sex objects and merchandise. I have an interesting statistic from uh, uh, a Duke Law journal written by Professor Cass Sustin. It said that some of the sexual violence against women would not have occurred but for the massive circulation of pornography. In fact, I believe if we ever really discover the truth, it would not be just some, it would be the majority of all these things would not have occurred but for the massive circulation of pornographer. And in this particular Law Journal article, they went on to cite other countries and other, did kind of a cross-cultural data study with it, and they concluded this, that the liberalization of pornography laws in the United States, Britain, Australia, and the Scandinavian countries have been accompanied by a rise in reported rape rates. In other words, the more liberal country becomes in regard to the laws concerning pornography, then the, the incidences of rape go up. In countries, on the other hand, where pornography laws have not been so liberalized, there's been a less steep rise in reported rapes. And in countries where restrictions have been adopted, reported rapes have decreased. And for people to stand up in a courtroom and say, well, there's really no relationship to these things. Listen, pornography desensitizes you and moves you to a realm where you become hardened to what true values are and what is important in life and what is pure in life. And ultimately, if you continue that route, leads to, according to all these studies cite, deviant behavior in your life. And I believe that pornography is just as addictive as any drug out there and destroys the people who are brought into it and expose themselves for it and pay for it and who just feel it's their freedom to do whatever they want to do. Again, you have that freedom to do whatever you want to do. But when it begins to destroy other people's lives, you, don't, you shouldn't exercise that particular ability or freedom. But not only children, and not only women, but also men. Men who are addicted, men who, become, who are soon become perpetrators of other crimes as well as become victims of pornography, they are also being destroyed. It's a tragedy when you look across the culture and see just how many hearts and how many homes and how many lives are being destroyed. It's a direct result to pornography. James put it this way. He, in, in 1 and 13 through 15, you look up the whole passage, but just a little synopsis of what he says there. And James said, listen, when lust is conceived, it brings forth death. If you choose to go this route and satisfy your desires, and that's all that's important to you, it brings forth death. The Bible says in the last days it would be like this. It said men's God would be their belly. What does that mean? It means your appetites are what you serve. Whatever you want is what you take. If you want immorality, you have immorality. If you want adultery, you have adultery. If you want pornography, you take pornography. So whatever my appetite calls for, that's what I want because that's who I serve. Men's gods would be their belly. And it goes on to say, their glory would be their shame. In other words, the things they ought to be ashamed of, they glory in. It's kind of like, how can you call a national kiss in at Chick-fil-A from homosexual couples and it's something that the Bible says is a shame but yet they glory in it. But this just shows you where we've come as a nation and where we've come in time and where we are in regard to the last days. 
And what happens to people who are involved, not only is it, is it harmful to them, as we said, it's harmful to others. In fact, it, what it does to you is it so destructive, it destroys your integrity, your self-esteem. It destroys any kind of meaningful relationships that you might have with any, anybody else. It destroys moral absolutes. And all too often, literal death comes, as well as guilt and some kind of odd twist. Exposure to pornography, if you continue to go down that right, route, Psychologists and sociologists tell us it always leads to a lower net return each time. What do you mean? It basically means to say that more, the more pornography you see, the more you need to see. And the more explicit the images are, then the more explicit they must become the next time to entice the same kind or arouse the same kind of excitement. In other words, it never satisfied. It always takes you deeper and deeper into relationships looking at some woman on a screen or whatever, roam, your eyes roam across the images and look at all that goes on in pornography from, you know, leering at women who, who have uh, no demands upon you and whom you have to have no respect for and who never speak back to you and can never say no to you. In those kind of relationships with pornography, male or female, listen, there's no respect. There's no exchange of respect. There's no exchange of commitment. There's no exchange of love. And there's nothing more than using using men or using women like animals to be some sex object just for somebody's inverted, perverted sexual pleasure. By the way, let me go back and remind you as far as Christians are concerned what the Bible has to say. The Bible tells us what Jesus said in Matthew 5 again, that it's lusting in your heart is to commit the sin. I remember reading one woman's story. It says, my husband began using porn as a teenager. What was once an adolescent hobby became the other woman in our marriage. She went on to say, at first it was our intimacy that suffered. Then his pastime grew into an addiction, by the way, which it always does, which then started to include more serious forms of adultery. He was going to strip bars. He was sleeping with prostitutes. He was often late with poor excuses. And then I noticed our money began to disappear and never suspected he was spending nearly $500 a week to feed his addiction. That's just a story that's been repeated over and over and over again. Families, wives, children directly affected. Women who've been raped, sexually abused, impacted forever. Babies born out of wedlock, impacted for the rest of their lives. Babies born with sexually transmitted disease. Young people who become scarred for life. Children scarred for life. Marriages that are broken beyond repair. The dignity of women is degraded. The dignity of men is degraded. And they're viewed as simple animals like women becoming bunnies. Teens. Their minds being brainwashed by our culture to believe that this kind of behavior is natural and normal and everybody's doing it. Well, you've heard me make the argument before. that We could walk out here to the septic system behind the church. And we can peel the lid off that first tank. And you can look down into that nasty human waste and say, well, that's natural, it's normal, and everybody's doing it. <laughs> but I don't want it running through my house. I don't want it in my living room. I don't want it in my bedroom. It's destructive. It's filled with disease, and it'll destroy your life. It's the same thing with pornography. Pornography. And our young people today are being brainwashed by a culture that says everything is okay. There's nothing wrong with experiencing intimacy without commitments and intimacy without marriage. But what you experience when you try to have true intimacy without a commitment to another person for your life in marriage, what you experience in that regard outside that picture is nothing but emptiness. And it's a tragedy. And we as America better wake up to just how bad this tragedy is. There are statistics that we could read today that would go on mind-numbingly long. I mean, we're not talking about the Bible statistics. I'm talking about what the world ignores as truth. And then you, then you go back and let's see what the Bible does say, and we'll see why it says what it says when you look at the culture that we're living in today. I think it's important for us to ask at this point, what can we do? And I'll close with this. I mean, there's always, you know, this, this, the mindset that we need to realize that we have somehow got to turn the tide of adultery in our country, and we have to do something. What can, what can we do as believers? Well, the First Amendment is the one that most people like to gravitate to that says, you know, it's freedom of speech, you know. It's freedom of speech, but it's not freedom of speech for things that are destructive. It's not freedom of speech for obscenity. 
It's not freedom of speech for indecency. There's no freedom of speech for, for pornography. And, you, 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 you know, we, we say that, oh, it's freedom of speech. But on the other side, we'll say, but, but you can't get up in the theater and yell, fire! That's not freedom of speech. A, it comes under the same kind of heading, all right? You don't have freedom of speech to go out and publicly libel people or slander people. You're going to face, the, you're going to face a court case for that. So this, the freedom of speech, you need to clearly understand what, what we're talking about when we talk about our constitutional rights. These things should not be protected. These things that are so destructive to our culture should not be protected under the First Amendment. In fact, in 1973, in a Supreme Court case ruled in the Miller versus California case, it said that this much has been categorically settled by the court that obscene material is unprotected by the First Amendment. By the way, that same court did vote in favor of Roe v. Wade. What do we do? We speak out at every opportunity. Well, Brother Joe, what if the court comes back within the coming years and said, all right, we've taken a stand. Now we believe that, that we're going to constitutionally make acceptable, you know, gay marriage in our country. And so that doesn't matter what you are. So this is what the Constitution says. And that's freedom of, uh, freedom of civil rights for everybody. This is the new definition of marriage. What are you going to do? I'll disagree with them. Just because the Constitution says it's all right, I don't live by the Constitution. I'm an American. I appreciate the Constitution. But I, first of all, I'm a Christian. I live by this book. This is the standard we live by. I think Paul, Peter gave us a clear illustration when he said to the, to the Sanders, go ahead and praise the Lord. Amen. You ought to praise the Lord for that. But Peter stood before the Sanhedrin and they told him they couldn't do what they were doing in preaching the Word of God. He said, should we obey man or should we obey God? I listened last night to some particular, I think it was even here on the Houston News, about some guy that was in a bakery shop, that had his own bakery shop. They came in and a gay couple came in and said, we want you to make our cake. He said, I don't do gay wedding cakes. And now we have the protesters and now we have the lawsuits and now we have everything else. That's where we've come to in our country. An owner of a business can stand up and say, I don't believe in, you know, in, 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 in gay marriage. I believe in what the Bible says, traditional marriage. And now it's become a big news issue in our country. We've got to learn to stand up and take a, take a stand. And let me tell you, I don't know if you're a Democrat or Republican or heretic, okay? <laughs> but you as a Christian are not called to first and foremost identify yourself with any party. That's right. You're called to identify yourself with the Word of God and God's put you in a country with constitutional laws that you can influence that country on a political level. Bless God, you better get to the voting booth and vote the moral standards that God has given us in His Word. Amen. I don't care what people call you. Let me tell you, some of you people who sit by election after election on your little blessed assurance and you never get to a voting booth and you never make a voice heard and you never stand up for anything, you're part of the problem, not the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some of you clap and hadn't voted in 20 years. <laughs> but when we have a president who stands up and says, well, you know, he, to get in office, he said, well, I'm pro-family, I believe in traditional values of marriage, I'm Christian. And then turns around the next... Three years later, so well, you know, I believe in gay marriage. It's not an issue of dem Democrats, Republicans, and black and white, or anything else this culture might make. It's an issue of right and wrong. And we need to vote people into place as long as we have a political voice to do so who stand up for traditional biblical values and say, this is what God says, and this is where I stand. And no matter what the rest of the country does, this is where I stand. And you have that freedom and you have that right and you have that power to make a difference. You have to be heard and you have to stand your ground and you have to make a difference. For the first step is first, so you get on your knees first, get right with God, and then you begin to pray for our nation because this is a spiritual battle that we're in. And historians have long told us that whenever you have a democracy, it won't last more than a couple hundred years because people begin to realize that they can put people in office who'll give them whatever they want. And that's where we are. Everybody wants a handout, everybody wants something free, and everybody wants a free ride. And that's where we come to. But it's time to, tr to reverse the course, and we reverse it first and foremost by getting on our face before God and waging the war in prayer. And the next thing, as I said, we need to be the light and the salt to our culture. Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. We need to shine and we need to be as salty as we can be by standing up at every opportunity that God gives us. The third and last thing is, we don't need to be taken prisoner of war. We need to know what's going on, 
in our life and get right with God. And then we need to know what's going on in our house and get it right with God. And there's some parents here who might be alarmed if you do a little house cleaning. If you did a little phone investigation, a little computer investigation, you might be shocked. Tim Ellis did a fantastic job last year, about a year and a half ago, and even at the couples retreat, reiterating it, the importance we need to take as parents and how we can protect our children from this kind of filth and from this kind of degradation of their moral character. And if you hadn't got those DVDs, they can still be ordered through the church office. Just put a, one of those DVD order forms and say, I want those Ellis videos. And they'll show you the steps of action that you can take as a parent to protect your children in the technological age that we live in. Protect your wife, protect your husband, protect yourself out there in the social media realm because we all become open targets in that kind of arena. Accountability is absolutely important to each other, to our families, to our parents, to our husbands, to our spouse. We need accountability with each other and even to our church. Now next week, we'll take up the next step of this whole series and probably wrap it all up, even though there's a thousand more things we'd like to say. How do you discover and how do you walk in purity in your life? How do, you, how do you experience that moral virtue that brings such power for living? How can you really genuinely be a winner in this regard and not brought into captivity and bondage in your life? It's called the pathway to purity. The pathway to purity. And the Bible gives some very clear instructions because God knew in our fallen nature this is exactly where we'd go. Romans chapter 1 says, when you deny God, this is the path you always take. Moral degradation, impurity, adultery, fornication, immorality, lesbianism, homosexuality. Just follow Romans chapter 1. When you refuse to honor God as God, you begin to worship and serve your body. That's what the Bible says. How do you reverse that course? How do you get back to that place? Well, first and foremost, it starts right here. You get down before God and you start praying. You begin to say, God, I want to be salt in life. I want to be a difference maker. I don't want to live in bondage. And God, I want to make a difference in my life and my family. I want to be the salt and the light in my culture. And I don't want to live as a prisoner of war. I want to live in freedom. None of us lives as islands unto ourselves. Every man, every woman in this room, every mother and dad, what you do affects your families. It starts with moms and dads and grandparents. Get your heart right with God so that you can give the kind of instruction to this next generation that is desperately needed to protect them from this world that we're living in that is so destructive. Add to your faith virtue. Step one. Would you stand with your heads bowed?